The Russian invasion of Ukraine in late February 2022 brought historic volatility to the financial markets. Traders and investors alike were forced to address the financial fallout as the markets reprised products such as crude oil, wheat, and the Russian ruble. According to several European economist panels, there is near certainty that Europe will soon be in a recession. Measures to dampen inflation are not free and will slow economies in Asia and all the Americas. Disastrous effects from the Russia-Ukraine war will include famine in Africa, uncertain energy prices globally, and deaths from a lack of heat this winter. The IONF has the global GDP growing at 2.9% in 2023. This will more likely be revised closer to zero. As the situation developed into an extended armed conflict, asset pricing ebbed and flowed in response to key events. Unprecedented sanctions, logistics challenges, and escalatory cycles all prompted periodic uncertainties. Subsequently, the world's commodity, currency, and shares markets were impacted dramatically by the geopolitical strife. Although the Russia-Ukraine war was localized, the engagement affected commodity markets around the globe. A few of the hardest hit were crude oil, natural gas, and wheat. In a new episode of the All In Podcast with Chamath Palihapitiya, Jason Kalakanis, David Sachs, and David Freiberg, industry veterans and besties, they discussed many topics, specifically the economic crisis relating to the U.S. economy, the crisis arising from the Russian-Ukraine conflicts, and why the economic crisis is not likely to get over soon. Before we listen to them, please remember to smash the like button and consider subscribing to the channel if you are yet to do so. Thanks for watching our videos. We appreciate you so much. Um, but to say that, you know, the, the U.S. economy is automated in a way where, you know, they can sit in front of some dashboard and, you know, see in real time what the true on the ground data is, is, is not really accurate, unfortunately. Maybe there's a Manhattan project type, you know, effort to do that at some point for the United States, but it's not now. Um, I'll give you uh, a bit of bad news and a bit of good news. Uh, and this is just me kind of, you know, again, looking at the mosaic and and kind of judging where we are today. The bad news is I think that it's going to be a really tough, sticky time for the U.S. consumer probably over the next 18 months. And so I tend to think that, you know, through the course of this year and through 2023 and possibly even a little bit of 24, it's going to be a grind. Unemployment will go back up. Inflation will be sticky. Real earnings will shrink. Consumption will uh, ebb and earnings will not be that great. The silver lining is I think that we are starting a bottoming process for the equity markets. And I think that by the end of this year or the early part of next year, most of that will be done. And the reason is that you know, the equity markets, I think, do a reasonable job of one, looking at the bond market, and then two, looking six to nine months into the future and pricing in that future today. And so by the end of this year, beginning of next year, I think that we will have kind of bottomed and we'll start to build a base. The thing to remind us, though, is that, you know, let's just say a stock goes down 20, 50%. Even if it rallies 50% from there, it's still 25% off from where yeah, it was. Yeah, people don't understand that. And people don't How understand that. to climb back up so, the mountain. So I, yeah. I would just, I would just think, you know, um, tell people that, you know, I think that David is right. I think that it's going to, uh, we're going to feel this for a while. Um, it's this inflation, as I've said for a long time, is going to be sticky and persistent. I think you're going to see Fed funds at or breaching 5%. And, uh, but I think that in terms of, you know, risk assets will bottom out by the end of this year, beginning of next year. I mean, Larry Summers had some good tweets this week. The weird, you know, the weird thing is Larry Summers seems to be like almost trying to make the case and make certain points because he's not being listened to. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's so ironic and sad to watch uh, because he's such a thoughtful economist and has such a, a, a great point of view and experience at, uh, to leverage here. And clearly, you know, he was banging the drums last year and no one was listening. And then he got public about it. And now he's more repeatedly public about things. The point that he's made, which I think plays into the, the political cycle question, which is where the tension arises, is in order to resolve ultimately uh, the inflation problem, you're going to have to see a significant increment in unemployment. And so when you raise interest rates, uh, you know, generally purchasing goes down, demand goes down, revenue goes down, layoffs happen. Uh, some businesses go bankrupt, et cetera. 
So then there's this trickle in the economy of, of less people being employed. And when that happens, it ultimately drives a political response, which is, hey, we're losing our jobs. People start asking their representatives, do something about this in Congress. And then these programs and these things get passed, which themselves are inflationary. And that's why it's very hard to predict ultimately when and how this all gets resolved, because we seem to have an administration that is enacting and um, embracing uh, inflationary policies to support what they consider to be economic growth and um, improved employment conditions in this country. And the unfortunate effect of many of those policies is inflation. And then it forces this difficult central bank decision-making cycle. And so there's a tension right now that doesn't seem to have a clear path to resolution. That um, is why it's very hard to, to have a clear prediction here. We also have a very significant question overhanging uh, all of these markets related to the price of energy, which is a key input to so many industries and, and, and drives cost, uh, as well as food, and also the military conflict in Eastern Europe. And, you know, we've, and, 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 and then there's in the financial markets, this big overhang question on what's going to happen with various countries that may default on their debt, as well as China's real estate bubble bursting. So I made this point, I think, a few episodes ago, but there's no easy answer that I can just say deterministically, here's my prediction of what's going to happen. Uh, as Chamath uses the term, I think it's a great term. There's this mosaic of things that are under, under consideration right now, and there's a tension between them all. Uh, and, um, and that's what makes it difficult. I'm sorry I didn't really answer the question, but that, that's, that's kind of how I there's think a about lot of, it. There's a lot of geopolitical thing. risk. Yeah. I mean, we're kind of you know, ignoring what happened this week where Putin basically is putting nukes back on the table. Now, I'm not saying that's likely to happen, but I don't know how, again, I don't know how this market gets a lot better with the risk of war three hanging over our heads. I mean, who wants to enter the market with that on and, the table? And by the way, the, the nukes, just, just to be clear, you know, um, it, you can hear certain military commanders speaking publicly about this, uh, but in the Russian military playbooks, uh, there is specifically defined actions that can lead to tactical nuclear weapon use in the field. There's no direct indication that these things are going to be used right away, but the as as Sachs says, there's like this weird like turning up the volume happening on, hey, maybe we're getting closer to a point where if Putin is having tactical failure in this conflict, there's more weaponry he can use that has greater impact. And unfortunately, there are these tactical nukes in his arsenal. And, you know, a, a guy that maybe has a certain psychology that has, as our friends have said, his back against the wall. He's not a person who in his career uh, or in his history has ever acquiesced to defeat. Alex Karp was on CNBC. He was really, really sharp and concise about this, which is that, you know, in the West, when leaders fail in their objectives, they just get elected out and somebody else takes their place. Yeah. But for somebody like Putin, there is nobody to take his place because it's a very zero sum situation. And so his actions will, as a result, also be zero sum. And I think folks- He's never acquiesced in his life. And yeah. Yeah, we've never, we've never really kind of like, we don't understand well what zero sum decision making looks like when it comes to stuff like this. He needs the golden bridge, right? You need to give him the golden bridge out. He does. Well, but, well, I'll, I'll just say two things. One is that I think it's been made pretty clear that both India and China will not stand beside Russia if they do something like this. Um, and I think that that is important because they still are the two biggest purchasers of, of Russian oil. And so I think that matters a lot because you're talking about a lot of revenue that would, that would go away. The Russia-Ukraine war had a dramatic influence on the world's financial markets. Western sanctions and retaliatory policies from Russia contributed to supply chain disruptions and currency volatilities. Ultimately, commodities and currencies experienced periods of chaotic price action as palpable uncertainty entered the marketplace. Though the true impact of war is unclear, businesses worldwide can feel its financial effects. In addition to the impact of the war on entities that have operations in Russia, Ukraine, or neighboring countries, or that conduct business with their counterparties, the war is increasingly affecting economic and global financial markets and exacerbating ongoing economic challenges, including issues such as rising inflation and global supply chain disruption. What do you make of the video and the opinions of the besties? Please let us know your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching.